you all for being there. Uh, those that have already been there, thank you for still being there. And those that arrived, welcome to the Street uh, Photography Festival, Luxembourg. So um, after Jane Evelyn Atwood, first conference, now we are uh, very happy to welcome Benita Sukodorev. I don't know if it's okay, Sukodorev, or the, the correct spelling of Sukodorev. Yes, mm. in English. It's okay, in Sukodorev. English, that yeah. would be the best way. Um, yeah. Well, for the, this, actually, this third conference, yesterday evening was Giacomo Sini, and now Benita Sukodorev. So, uh, a few words about Benita. <laughs> First, thank you very much to be with us. Um, <coughs> so, you are, I would say, very international, cosmopolitan, mixed, because you are Russian, you were, you were born in Russia, yes. then you moved to America where you, you, you grew, uh, you studied, Correct. you had your, um, your degree, bachelor's degree in liberal arts, focus on art history, and, and you continued, well, I've got all this information here, master of arts in English literature, so that's nice. And yes. then you came back, well, you know, you relocated to Berlin, in 2008, mm -hmm. where you <coughs> began an extensive documentation of the cosmopolitan cities art scene while working on diverse photographic projects. Okay, so the publications, you have got two main publications, two main books, which are here. Yes. This one? Yes, this is the, the first uh, this book. This one is the first Yes, one. and uh, of 48 Hours 40 Black Book. 48 Hours yes, Black Book. And, and Of Lions and Lambs lions is the sequel lambs. to yeah. 48 Hours Black Book. We will come back to them later. Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. And uh, your pictures have appeared <coughs> in different uh, media. For example, Nachtleben Berlin 1974, bis heute. Berlin Now, Te Neues Verlag. Uh, your work has been covered by several uh, media, including Arte, The Guardian, Zeit Online, ARD, uh, Kulturradio, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Berliner Zeitung Stern, uh, well, lot, a, a big list, uh, The Moscow Times, Tagesspiegel, among others. Yeah. And this week, uh, you had a coverage in Luxemburger Wort, in our own <laughs> paper <laughs> here in Luxembourg. Nice surprise. <laughs> So um, your work has been exhibited in solo and group shows nationally, so I guess in Germany, but also internationally, and it's part of different collections, for example, Raphael Tour Foundation for Contemporary Art in Barcelona, the Michael Orbach Stiftung in Cologne, and private collections in different uh, uh, countries, Moscow, Berlin, New York. Well, you live and work in Berlin currently? Yes. And uh, we are very happy that you are here with us. So I would say I, I discovered your work, how do you say in English, par hasard, per chance. Per chance. <laughs> uh, That's very appropriate yeah. to the work. I just <laughs> was uh, reading um, a, mm -hmm. a photo magazine and I happened to see an article about a review of uh, your book. I think it was this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I liked the pictures. I said, wow, that's uh, very nice. Uh, spontaneous dynamic pictures and and then it occurred to us to invite you to our street photography festival i would say yeah that's street photography in its purest way of approaching it what what you do but we we want to know a little bit more about why you <coughs> photograph how you work and what is your focus so that's why now we are going to make this presentation again more or less <laughs> I did say that uh, two hours ago, <laughs> after more or less 50 minutes, <laughs> we yes. have questions and answers, okay. Um, but yeah, we will also a little bit converse in between. So let's yes. do it relaxed. So yes. it's up to you now, Benita, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. First of all, thank you for inviting me. This was a really great surprise. Uh, I never really considered myself to be a street photographer, but I guess that's what I've become. <laughs> through the years. Um, yes, um, how can I begin? I, uh, I did not wake up one day and decide to be a photographer. Like Paolo mentioned, I studied liberal arts with a focus on art history. I was mostly interested in painting and um, writing, literature. And um, I took my first photograph um, when I was in college and I took an um, analog photography course. 
uh, very traditional, black and white, and I really fell in love with the medium immediately. And I would spend hours in the dark room and experiment. And uh, at the time, I, uh, I had no real inspirations and no real role models or photographers that I really looked up to or wanted to uh, imitate or, or learn from, necessarily. Uh, I was very open in my approach from early on. Uh, but I did, of course, uh, as a beginner, um, have some, had some restrictions uh, that I imposed on myself. Um, which resulted in images that were very, very calm, very classic, very neutral. There were no great contrasts or great experiments in the composition, uh, mostly portraits, because portraits have fascinated me uh, even in painting and in art history. I was always attracted to the human form, to figurative work, to faces, to gesture and expression. And this is how I started. I started immediately photographing people as soon as I had my first analog camera in my hand. Um, then came a point where I had a very long pause. This was in the United States while I was still in college. And for about 10 years, I didn't photograph anything. I devoted myself to my studies and just kind of, photography was just another field that attracted me, field in the arts. And I didn't consider myself to be a photographer. And as things happen in life, unexpectedly, and, and by coincidence, I uh, found myself in Berlin in 2008, um, which was about 10 years after I'd taken my first photograph. And uh, I had a digital camera with me at the time. I actually bought a, a very basic uh, Canon uh, single lens reflex camera. Um, and I had it with me. And um, a journalist friend needed a photographer to accompany him to an event and document this event. Just take free snapshots of the, the occasion and uh, yeah, there were no restrictions, and he just said, oh, you have a camera, just come along and just shoot some, at the time he called it trashy lemons, uh, <laughs> because uh, this particular event um, had different fruits and, and buckets, and it was something very Berlin, very uh, bizarre. And he said, come shoot some trashy lemons with me. And I said, okay, whatever that means. <laughs> and on that evening, I pretty much, for the first time, um, found myself in an environment where I worked Mm, very freely and very spontaneously without really having any expectations, not of myself and uh, not of others. And I just shot whatever attracted my eye, whatever I felt was unusual, interesting, faces, moments, atmosphere, uh, in color at the time. There was still, uh, there was no black and white at that moment for me, although I started black and white when I shot analog. This was all in color because I understood that color was what the magazine uh, wanted. It was an online uh, art magazine. And as a result, uh, yeah, I just delivered the images that were requested. And uh, as it turned out, the magazine was so happy with what they received that they published the full series online. And uh, my friend uh, told me, wow, looks like you, ha you have a hand, you have an eye for this, come again. And then before I knew it, I found myself immersed in the Berlin uh, nightlife and art scene and was going to different events and uh, taking photos of whatever attracted my eye and sometimes uh, portraits of, of um, guests and, and important uh, speakers or visitors, or it depends on the event, really. And for a little while, I actually um, worked for a news agency, but I soon found out that that work was not for me because it, it offered very little creative uh, um, possibilities, and I had to spend all night uh, chasing celebrities who came to galas and red carpet events, and this was something that really did not fulfill me, just exhaust me, and uh, I quit that. And I just said, okay, I'll just go wherever I want to go and shoot whatever I want to shoot um, and do it for myself, and if anyone is interested and, and wants to publish this particular work, then great. But it was sort of a semi-profession for me. It wasn't really, didn't really feel like it was, I was doing it professionally, it just felt like I was doing it for myself, but the quality was, was on a certain level, but for the most part it was something that I just did because my soul demanded it. And uh, this was really uh, my beginning, um, and I shot most of my work indoors, so I was nowhere near shooting on the street at the time. I was always in some kind of uh, interior space, at an opening, at an event, at a party. And Berlin, as you may know, has a very um, lively night scene, art scene. Um, so I found myself in events that had um, 
burlesque characters and uh, masquerades and uh, all kinds of fashion fashion parties and uh, in those places, I, I, I just uh, let myself uh, follow my intuition and shoot whatever I felt moved me. And usually uh, what moved me were the gestures of people, their face expressions, and what I like to call for myself the transitional moment. It's not so much the decisive moment that we hear about from uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, um, that's one thing, but the transitional moment can be decisive, but <laughs> it isn't always decisive. It's sort of the moment b between states, when a person is unaware they're being photographed and they, they are caught in a contemplative moment. Mm -hmm. And the you moment s in between. The moment in between, what has passed and what is about to come, and you just sort of catch that split second mm -hmm. that doesn't return. And uh, I had an eye and an interest precisely for that moment. So um, the first uh, series of images that I brought um, is actually a potpourri of, of, of everything I shot on that particular art scene and nightlife scene. It's not a particular project um, and the images do not belong to particular projects. Um, when it comes to projects, I guess I should mention that um, until Blackpool and perhaps a little bit until before uh, I found myself in Blackpool, um, the only time I really shot um, based on, on a certain intention, project-based, was when I worked in the studio. Because there was a phase after I worked on the nightlife and art scene that I opened my own studio space and uh, I devoted myself entirely to portraiture at the time. So there, were, there had been a couple of projects, uh, portrait projects, uh, one of them, you, you could find this on my website, um, titled Woman in Heat, where I uh, portrayed a um, series of women over the age of 45 from different nationalities, and I portrayed them uh, as they are, with wrinkles, with, with, uh, with whatever they bring with them. And, and that particular project was a bit long-term for me, uh, followed by another project titled Burnout, where I photographed young people who come to Berlin and find themselves pretty much living in squats and uh, sort of looking for their place under the sun. And I shot a series of, of portraits uh, at the time as well. Um, but that period came to an end fairly quickly because I found the studio environment uh, a bit restrictive. I felt like I really couldn't allow myself uh, to be as free as, 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 as I wanted to be. And then I ended up on the street <laughs> shooting um, street photography, so to speak. But before we get to that, I actually I do have the, the studio images with me, but I, I don't think we should you know focus on them so much because we are at a street photography festival and it's about really about action and spontaneity and about um, you're curious. Yes. Well yeah maybe we will we'll come to that just to kind of give you an idea of the different phases that uh, a photographer can go through, at least in my case, the phases I'd gone through. Uh, but we will start, like I said, from this particular nightlife imagery. <coughs> and um, I'd like to point out that, mm, I don't know how many of you are familiar with my uh, Blackpool work. Um, it is different from my nightlife imagery, but um, it does share certain elements in common. And those are mainly sort of my approach to the human subject. And uh, regardless whether it happens on the street or it happens in a room, there is a certain common denominator in the way I photograph people, how close I come to people, how I catch them in this, like I mentioned, transitional moment. So it's not like every image will have a story behind it. Uh, I could tell you where it was taken, but I don't think that's really as important as uh, what the image tells and how the image speaks for itself. Um, as opposed to my colleagues, Giacomo and Jane Evelyn, um, these are not lengthy reportage um, stories, but they are all sort of uh, slices of life and moments, and each image has its own story. Sometimes we can guess it, sometimes we cannot, but I leave it up to the viewer to fill in the blanks, so to speak. So we can uh, <laughs> begin, as we already have here. This is, uh, yeah, just a, a moment of a couple of eccentric characters at a at an event. Um, yes, this is a snake taken at a, at a burlesque party, uh, something very sinister and, and dark to the image, but also very pretty because we see the petals 
on the floor, and we could see also the wooden boards, how used up they are, because there's been a lot of partying going on in that room. Um, and uh, yes, a bit, a bit, uh, a little morbid maybe, maybe not, a little Frankenstein, maybe not. Um, but again, those are all just um, impressions of things that um, I saw and uh, people I met. And uh, some images have a bit of a vintage feel to them, a bit, a bit of a historic feel, um, aesthetic. The question of aesthetics is always important in an image, uh, but it can play out differently, depends on the image. There's of course a very lively gay scene in Berlin, and this was taken on the street as it happens. Like I mentioned, this is a mix, so it's not from a particular project. Um, this is a, a young man dressed as a woman that happened to have passed by as I was there with my camera. And some, have, some people have told me that I don't want to be there when you're there with the camera because <laughs> I never know what, how you, what light you will portray me in. I uh, really make sure that I photograph things uh, as authentically as possible because that's the only type of photography that I appreciate for myself. And, and, and I think it's important to be very natural in your approach and, and just be true to, to, to whatever it is you feel at that moment. And not think so much, but do rather than, than think. Uh, because bef as soon as you start thinking too long, the moment is gone. Um, yes. This is a, an image at a, at a fashion event. And um, as you can see, the young woman is a bit out of focus. She's, she's a little blurred. This is not something that I have an issue with as a photographer. <coughs> the technical aspect of, a, of an image is not really my priority. I'm more concerned <coughs> with what is depicted and what it is I'm trying to show and tell. And uh, I think it's a nice contrast between these two young women. And um, yes, she's pretty, but I think there's a little more than that going on, except that she's pretty. <coughs> this is a bit of a, of a spray of color. A uh, very well-known DJ in Berlin that I photographed for a magazine. Yes, like I said, these are all images that you see from the early 2000s or sort of, yeah, mid 2000s, not even. <clears throat> and of course, you know, these images have a lot of, have a great sense of hedonism. And um, this is something that actually I feel uh, usually very attracted to, um, to understand, you know, the human motivation behind this kind of escapist behavior and trying to disconnect from reality by seeking uh, different ways of, of, of finding enjoyment. And um, in different, uh, environments and different maybe social classes, um, you see the same impulse to look for pleasure and for escape, but in different ways very often. Um, my Blackpool work also shows people looking for ways of escape, but they're from a different social class, so they do it their way. But ultimately, it's a very fundamental need I find in, in, in almost every environment I find myself in um, for people to try to, to find a way to disconnect from the everyday and to look for some kind of pleasure. And in Berlin you see that a lot. And this is something that intrigued me, maybe partially because I grew up in southern Connecticut, which is uh, not a very exciting place <laughs> to live in. And uh, maybe I didn't have enough partying going on <laughs> when I was growing up. So when I arrived in Berlin, of course, I was, I was really uh, excited by, by all these different um, nuances, interactions between people, and um, this eternal search for, for, for pleasure that you see everywhere. This is um, an image of a, of a band, of a very well-known performance band called Bonaparte, and uh, I photographed them as well, photographed images um, of performers and um, dancers and um, bands. Then, of course, we have moments like this, which are very candid, um, she lifted her skirt at that moment and I was there and, and I loved her tattoo and just the way there are a lot of interesting textures and what's going on in the image. Um, it's really about a feeling more than about concrete information. But as you can see, most of the individuals, when you see their faces, that they're a bit lost and they're a bit um, contemplative and they're not necessarily happy. So um, the question is always, 
you know, you look for the happiness and then different uh, wherever you go, but do you really find it? And as it seems that uh, it isn't easy to find, even in places where you think people are having a very good time. Yes, and of course there are, there are interesting characters. There are people who pose for the camera, who see a camera and immediately they pose. And then of course there are those who, who don't pay attention, don't notice my presence. So it really, it varies on location and, and on the people involved. This is a young woman from a um, rock band who likes to walk around naked with her guitar in her studio. So of course she was very open-minded <laughs> when I arrived and wanted to take photographs of her. Um, Yes, there's no, there's no uh, big heavy story behind any of this, but there are all individual stories to these people and their individual search. This is very typical Berlin. You see that a lot. All these um, toilets where young people just go and change and, and come and go. And uh, there's always this very dynamic element in all the images. There is an emotion. And uh, this is really what interests me, is that particular emotion. And the story is, is secondary. The emotion comes first. Yes, the energy. Energy, this impact, this, this, this power. Because in a way, uh, this is precisely what, what pushes me to take photos, is my own energy and my own power, which pushes me ahead. So I think I am automatically attracted to, to these kinds of moments that reflect that kind of energy back to me. I think that each photographer brings himself, herself into his or her work. This is, I think, it's inescapable. We photograph the things that attract us and they attract us because somehow they reflect who we are. And uh, that doesn't mean that I'm a party animal just because I <laughs> photograph people partying, but there is a certain intensity and, and a certain tension behind that intensity um, that I'm after. Of course, you photograph somebody on stage, uh, you, you can expect more intensity than if you photograph someone sitting on a bench and just being contemplative, but there's always a, a story behind. And um, that's what we don't see, is that which interests me the most. And um, yes, like here, for instance, you see, there is <laughs> definitely something that you see, but it's her expression, and it's this, this, there's a certain tension to her, and the beauty, and the, uh, yes, and this is like a, a social, uh, the social elite, and the way they entertain themselves, and obviously he's looking with great disdain at this woman who's having champagne poured into her mouth, and <laughs> she's in a horizontal position. Um, so, this is, um, yes, here we have a, a mask and in a way you can always see some some sort of connotation in an image um, you can read an image in different ways <clears throat> and of course you meet a lot of uh, unusual characters on the scene and sometimes they look straight into the camera and uh, sometimes not <laughs> so huh? yes Yes, yes. I, I, I usually, whenever, no matter where I photograph, I really blend in. I, I work discreetly, discreetly in what sense? That I don't, I don't really push my camera in people's faces, but I do if I have to, but when they're open to it. And I'm, con I'm constantly in motion, I move around, and I let myself, on the street I go with the flow, and in a room I blend in the crowd. And I go wherever my eye pulls me. This is where I go, and the camera comes with me. So uh, all my senses are working simultaneously. It's a very, very interesting process. And sometimes you take, in, you take a photograph, and then only after you see it later, you realize what you really saw in the photograph. Because as you were shooting it, you were almost too fast mm -hmm. to, to recognize what you were seeing, but your eye saw it already. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of information that we perceive on a certain unconscious level and it reveals itself to us later on. And it's, it's this, this type of work where, where we're not necessarily um, planning an image in advance, but we are open to coincidence, to chance, we're open to spontaneity. This is precisely the process that I find so exciting in photography. And um, I think working on the street allows that. 
and uh, finding yourself in, in very you know, close environments where you're very close to people. I mean, this is a very, very uh, close proximity here. And uh, I mean, his face tells pretty much everything that goes on around him. And uh, I mean, this, um, some images speak for themselves much more than, um, so it doesn't really, this is a, a double exposure that, that happened. Um, this is not Photoshop, and I thought this image was really representative of, of the energy that you see in, in, in that kind of an environment. All the hands, and there's a certain greed, greed for pleasure, greed for, for this excitement and for just uh, letting yourself go. And I enjoy watching people as they let themselves go. And I, I managed to somehow um, distance myself from them while at the same time being a part of it all. Um, and it happens very naturally. And I like that, I get my charge out of it. So it's not like, as you can imagine in, in images, like, looking at images like these, um, you don't actually go out to a party looking for a story and you don't actually go there looking for certain types of images. You have some idea of the kind of characters you might encounter and the kind of moments you might see, but everything is very open. Mm -hmm. So you have no intention, and I, that's what I enjoy. I like to just go someplace and let things come to me, let the were moments. Were you doing that on your own, freely, or were you under commission? Um, no, at this point, when uh, all these images that I'm showing right now, they were not under commission. I know when there are certain events and there are certain parties going on, and I know if it's a, ni a party where the t 1920s uh, costumes, or it's a, it's a band that's uh, performing, or it's in, this was taken, for instance, at Camera Work Art Gallery. It's a very well-known gallery in Berlin, and this is um, a young French model, and she was just sitting there and, and, and just uh, looking around her, and I, I thought she was, she was fascinating, just the way she looked. So I'm really very open when it comes to what comes, what enters my lens. I'm not um, just focused only on, 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 on one thing and that's all I'm looking for. But um, yeah, I'm very open-minded when it comes to where I point my camera. I should mention that I, um, and this will become especially relevant when we come to the Blackpool series, that I rarely shoot through the viewfinder I uh, almost never look through the viewfinder, so I shoot from the hip or just, yeah, I mean, I, I use the camera as an extension of my arm, pretty much. It's, it's just like a, a connection between me and my environment, but I don't look into the viewfinder and look for my image. I have a sense of, 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 of the space and, and the composition, and I know what will be captured, and, and I can imagine how it will be captured, and I just shoot. And um, in that sense, I'm also very, very free. Yes, sorry, I keep, <laughs> I keep clicking on the, on the wrong arrow. Yes, and here you can also see this uh, blurriness, and um, then you have moments like these. And here it's especially interesting how the gentleman in the back is uh, <laughs> inspecting the scene. This you see a lot in Berlin. Um, of course, mm, one can say, yeah, those are just image of people, p images of people having fun and just going crazy. But um, there's always something behind it that tells a little bit more than just um, the fact that they're having fun, but what it is exactly that they're looking for and why. And this is more a bit of a more of a, of a classic portrait, um, also taking at a party. So there's really different ways of approaching uh, the same subject. You can photograph in the same environment, completely different images come up. Yes, this is again um, the disco ball performer, this face expression and just, uh, yeah, this is another moment. This is a bit more street. This was a, also a party, but it was outside. But you can also notice that the compositions here in terms of, of balance, uh, that they're also very open. There's no, uh, you know, gold middle and, and, you know, I'm not really thinking so much what the composition would be like. What is important for me is to show what I see and get it in the shot and everything else just happens um, by itself. Yes, this is also on the nightlife scene, also cost a lot of uh, costumes and, and that kind of a thing going on. Um, 
Yes, this is a very close shot. This woman looks like she's been living in that party pretty much <laughs> <laughs> since she was born. <laughs> I mean, she was uh, definitely uh, letting herself go. And uh, those are, those are, those are, this is actually, this particular image is from a project, actually, a smaller project called High Society, where I photographed some high society parties, where what you see uh, is really, hardly resembles the hi high society that you would imagine when you hear the, the term. Um, <clears throat> but again, this is a contradiction, and I like to play with contradictions in my work. Uh, I think that in the contradictions is where the tension um, found, and tension is found. This is also a double exposure, and what I mean by double exposure is that I shot with a flash, and somebody flashed at the same time, and then we had a double flash, and then I, uh, I thought it was fun, and it was really cool how it came out, and I kept it. But these are, these are really the early days, and, and I mean, if you sum up the years that I've been photographing, you would come up to maybe 12 years. So <laughs> it isn't really such a long time. But I have been very prolific, and I've been shooting a lot, so uh, this is just a fraction of what I brought with me. Um, but it certainly gives you an idea of the things that I'm after, and, uh, and the dynam dynamism of, of my photography. And of course, there are all these underlying um, components, the sort of socio-cultural underlying components of, of how people interact and how they present themselves to the camera and the things they really want to hide and the things they really want to show. And it's these nuances that I find to be very, um, very exciting when I find myself in that kind of an environment. Yes, you see that kind of thing also. This was taken at a gay bar. Uh, with a, like a really underground gay bar in, uh, in Berlin. And this is an American young man who just travels to Berlin to just uh, <laughs> do his thing, whatever, <laughs> whatever that is. Um, yes, and an older woman who is also giving herself fully. This is uh, on, the, on the cabaret scene. I shot a lot on the burlesque and cabaret and review scene in Berlin, and this is one of the performers uh, wearing her chains and leather in the dressing room. This was taken backstage. Um, and again, here we have a bit of contrast between the way she sits and the way she presents herself and her face expression, and these kind of contrasts and uh, these passing moments is what I, what I love. I love to capture what cannot be captured again because it has passed. And this is what, what, what excites me. I kind of get my own high <laughs> when, I, when I'm out there. And, and of course, I, I come very close to my subject. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not shy to, to approach, but I work very fast because, like I said, you, you can't be slow and actually capture what you're after if you're too slow. And um, yes, this is, Yes, this is youth, uh, the youth of Berlin celebrating what they see on stage. That's actually what they saw on stage, and that's the, <laughs> that's the, the, the young boys and girls that were enjoying. Yes, this is also, it has something iconic about it. This is also a couple of performers. Um, Yes, this is um, a young woman, a rapper from, from the United States who was in Berlin, and I photographed her after her performers, performance. Yes, and here we have also such, again, these kinds of characters. And the gazes, you know, the gazes of people, how they look, where they look. Um, this is also what interests me. Of course, after shooting a lot on the nightlife scene, and, and I realized that I need something that has um, a bit more depth, and then I kind of moved into the studio and locked myself in it and started shooting really heavy stuff and portraits uh, that show a different l layer of human psychology, not so much when they're out there looking for pleasure, but more, um, yeah, the, the, the emotional, psychological aspects. So that was my studio phase, but then I found myself 
going back to where the action is uh, with Blackpool primarily, but before Blackpool, we will get there in a moment, I brought some of the very first street photography images I think I ever shot, uh, which will come in a moment. And uh, they were in color. Um, yes, this is again backstage at a cabaret. And this is uh, what used to be a nightclub uh, before COVID arrived. And this is what it looked like <laughs> after the nightclub has uh, closed. I shot this actually fairly recently, but the others are older. Yes, and this is, uh, here we are to my first sort of, at, at my first street series. Uh, this image and, and the few images that follow was taken in Miami in an area, a neighborhood called Little Havana where um, Cuban, Cuban residential area. And uh, I, I was in Miami at the time and I heard they have a festival going on and I had my sm small camera with me and not even my DSLR, I had a little Sony. <laughs> and I went out and I said, let me just uh, shoot, see what's going on. And this was sort of my, my very beginning, uh, photographing people on the street. And as you can see, again, there's a focus on, on, on human face expression and uh, gesture, but there is always the element of, of something eccentric, of costumes or, or special outfits, and that adds a lot of character to the image. And so if I hear that there's a there's an uh, sort of event going on when people are strangely dressed, I would be happy to go there because I find that uh, visually appealing. Uh, but that is, of course, not the focus of the image. It's the person that's always in focus uh, for me. And, uh, yeah, as you can see, very different states that these two girls are in. They're standing close, but one is completely in a different uh, place, while this one is entirely focused on, on uh, all these you know, physical and visual uh, pleasures that she is uh, partaking in. Yes, and this was, of course, uh, highly representative of that, of that neighborhood and all the trash and, and, and just how people just let themselves go and, and um, all the mess around them. And the USA on his, on his cap is also very representative of that area. Yes, here, here was actually um, one of the first times that I found myself going with the flow and flowing with the crowd mm -hmm. and, and blending in to the, to the movement on the street and photographing people. And, and I do tend to, to find myself more attracted to, to expressions and, and that are not necessarily uh, full of joy because I find that in these expressions, uh, there's more thought, more depth. there's more depth, there's, there's more uh, mm, sensitivity and, and, and more compassion and, and kind of, uh, you wanna know the story more when you look at a person uh, with that face expression than just someone laughing wildly, mm -hmm. because then, you know, there always has to be some, some question in an image and then the image, then you want to study it longer. An image that tells you everything immediately is not an image that I would necessarily feel attracted to. So you, you, have to, you, you should want to return to an image and, and investigate it further for yourself. And of course for each person, for each viewer, it's, it's, it's a different image. One may find uh, one image more telling than another. But again, she's dancing and her face is telling a completely different story. And uh, yes, this is also a bit, a bit of a homeless. Um, this is a girl that was stripping on the street or semi-stripping, dancing, table dance. Um, so as you can see, I, I, I experiment a lot with angles too, from below, from above, from the side. I, I don't, this is, I, I just, I let myself, uh, go with the flow. Yeah, this is, um, again, uh, this is back in Berlin uh, now from <laughs> my left Miami. And this is also uh, one of the images I shot 
fairly early on when I started working on the street. This is from the Christopher Street Day Parade in Berlin. Uh, and here I was moving more and again uh, in the direction of black and white. And um, yes. Again, and I'm, I'm shooting here. Um, this was also an important phase for me, moving from shooting with a portrait lens, um, which is what I used mostly uh, when I started out. Mm -hmm. And on the street, working with a portrait lens is not the best mm -hmm. idea. Those of you who are photographers, you would know that you need to, to, to get more in the shot. You need a bit of a wider angle. But of course, you have to be careful with the wide angles, not that they get too wide, and then the distortion is too great. I think that here, the distortion is, is, is OK. You can live with it. and. Uh, He's the focal point, so it works. But any more wide angle than that would have could have been a problem. Yes, this is uh, someone who knows how to have a good time uh, to the end, till <laughs> till till he's out. Yeah, yeah. This is a techno truck with techno music, and he's really enjoying. Yes. And, and uh, I guess I should mention also in, in connection with all these costumes and, and all these eccentric characters is that uh, I've always felt myself attracted to the unordinary. So uh, the more eccentric or, or, or unordinary an individual is, uh, the more I feel pulled to, to take a picture uh, of that person. Um, this is, I guess this explains why there are so many <laughs> masks and costumes and whatnot. Um, here. And of course, here we have this interesting element of the bois with his uh, <laughs> cowboy hat and face. And this is like so some things that just don't go together. But they do somehow. For them, they work. Yes. And again, wh when you find yourself on the street shooting, and, and especially in an event like that, like a parade, you're overwhelmed with, 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 with images. I mean, there are images everywhere. There are photo opportunities uh, every, every split second. Uh, so it's, it's very important, I find, in my experience, to, to really know what you're after. Not necessarily plan what, what you want to photograph, but to know what it is that pulls you. Because if you, you, you can find yourself very easily just uh, strewn about and just shooting here and there, and then nothing concrete, uh, because there's a lot of information. And you need to be careful selecting what information is in your image because some information adds, other information subtracts. And you want the image to be balanced, but you also want the image to be, uh, to, 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 to be informative, to, I mean, to, to um, document something specific and show what it is that you saw to the viewer. Um, yes. And I find always there, there, there are different ways to approach, um, to photograph the same subject. I mean, it happened to me that another photographer and myself, we photographed the same person and it was a completely different kind of image, uh, which is again a proof that, you know, each one of us shoots our own way and uh, we all feel attracted to different things. But in general, this, this whole craziness is, is something that I find uh, fun to investigate with my photography. Just, yeah. just like people going nuts and just, yeah, I ask, yeah. Staging themselves. Staging themselves, this, this, this exhibitionism and this, this hedonism. And, and I, I photograph it not just because it looks cool, I photograph it because on some level I ask myself what moves these people, what pushes them, and what, what is their, their main motivator to do what they do, to look for what they look. So in a way, I'm interested in the psychology of these people, but I don't necessarily uh, come so close to them to get to know them in order to investigate their motivation. This is something I would do if I were working on a particular project, mm -hmm. and I would speak to people. But on the street, I find, uh, I don't think, as a, for me, coming close to people on the street is really not necessary. This is really not something that I'm after, mm -hmm. that kind of closeness. I think it's a different approach. But you, you don't laugh at them. You're not ridiculing, ridiculing them. You are at their mm -hmm. level. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, like, um, speak British close, speak to the, the British yeah. photographer that gets very close to people, 
uh, yeah. but makes fun of them. Yeah, or like someone like Bruce Gilden, yeah? I mean, yes, you all know Bruce Gilden. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a point where, where you turn a street into a zoo or into a circus, and I think that's a point that I, I don't want to come to because this is really not what my, my intention is. Um, I'm not out there to, fo to photograph people as freaks mm -hmm. and to show how ugly they are or how mm -hmm. disgusting or, or stupid. Or, or I, I, I document objectively, but it's not really strict documentation that I'm after, but it's also not sensation. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for sensation. It, it may have sensational elements to it, the image, but um, this is really not my goal to shock someone uh, with a photograph and say, wow, look how fat she is, or, oh, look how ugly, or what pimples, her whole face is just, th this is something that is really of no interest to me because I find that it, it overwhelms you to, to an extent that you even become desensitized. The shock factor is, is, is desensitizing, it's too much, and you immediately yeah. lose the impact when you have images like that. So you have to really maintain a balance, I think, as a photographer, between being very explicit, but also being subtle enough. And this balance between the subtlety and explicitness is what is, um, in my opinion, very important to find. Mm -hmm. Especially when, when you work with images where there's lots and lots of information around, in spaces that have lots of information, like on the street. And uh, I very rarely crop. I almost never mm -hmm. crop my images. I, I shoot spontaneously, and that's how it comes out. And I would crop if, for instance, there would be a very disturbing element in the shot. I would crop it. But usually, I don't have these elements because I, I think my eye just filters them mm -hmm. before I, I go for, for the image, before I press the shutter. Yes, this is also part of the parade when it rained. And this was really nice to, to photograph the people. And here I really held the camera really high up because I wanted to capture this, this um, movement. There was no ladder there <laughs> waiting for me where I could climb. So I literally stood on my toes and held the camera really high, really not knowing what's what I'm going to capture. But uh, as it turned out, this girl was at the center. And I love that she was wearing a bathing suit in the middle of a street parade. <laughs> and it rained and it was really very timely. And there's a lot of joy in this image and it's just a fun image to look at and uh, certain innocence. And this is also one of my favorite images. And, and this was shot at the very end of the parade when I was um, walking down the street. And this is the Siegesäule, the victory column in Berlin, which is where the parade usually commences, I mean, uh, ends. And that's a very, very uh, important spot. And uh, this is a man dressed as a woman, a very tall man, and uh, he was walking in the sequence gown in my direction as I was uh, with my camera, and I just couldn't not take a picture. And as we know, um, um, drag queens, uh, trans, uh, transvestite, they're, they're pretty exhibitionistic, so they enjoy being photographed. And as you can see in this image, uh, he, she, I don't even know the name because she left really fast, uh, immediately opened up to me. And, and this gesture and this road and everything leading to the victory column is for me a build that is very representative of everything that this kind of gay parade stands for. This openness and this freedom and all this chaos that, that is left when it's over and, and all the mess on the street. And, um, um, and of course you see images like that as well, which are not happy images. Of, of, uh, elderly men sitting at a bus station in a lace dress and uh, with a w plastic wine glass. And uh, this after is really the after the party, when the party is over in more ways than one, yes. Um, so it's important, I mean, to me, when I'm out there, my eye is everywhere at the same time. I almost feel sometimes that I have a peripheral vision. I sometimes feel as if I, I see what's behind me because I, I'm constantly searching uh, and it's so fast that I, I sometimes, I don't know what I'm searching for, but it just, when I find it, I know. And um, yes, here we're in Blackpool, and this is, um, this is the work, yeah, this is, um, exactly, this is this book, which, which was released in 2018, and um, 
it was received a lot of media attention and, and sold out very quickly, um, also unexpectedly for me, but I guess it had something to do with the fact that it was linked with the Brexit phenomenon. And as soon as it, it's linked with politics, people get very excited <laughs> and then they just buy the books. Um, in any case, uh, connecting this work with anything political was not my intention at all. I will um, tell you how I actually ended up uh, with this book and with this project to begin with. It's very appropriate to my style in general um, that I just let things happen to me and, and sort of, I, I believe in chance and coincidence and just sort of following, following your gut instinct about things. And um, Blackpool, for those of you who don't know, it's a coastal town in the northwest of England. And um, it's a town that in the 18th century was uh, meant as a resort for the British upper classes. And then towards the later 19th century, uh, it started attracting more middle and working class um, visitors. And uh, today, Blackpool is associated very much with uh, bachelor parties and uh, trash food and trash entertainment and just a lot of families too who um, come to Blackpool from neighboring towns to, to have fun for the weekend to just forget life, forget hard work, and just uh, let themselves go completely. Again, uh, in this particular series, um, you will see a certain, to a certain extent the very motivation that, that you see in the nightlife images, only that it, we're dealing with a different country, with a different social class, and with different means of looking for the same thing. And the same thing is escape. Escape from the ordinary, escape from the everyday, and escape by all means possible, through food, through gambling, through alcohol, through partying. Um, and you see this on all, in all age groups in Blackpool. How I ended up in Blackpool? Uh, by coincidence. <laughs> I knew nothing of Blackpool whatsoever. And um, a colleague of mine, a friend who's a photographer, uh, um, who doesn't photograph the happiest pictures in the world, um, Milon Zovnia. Um, a German photographer, German-Ukrainian. He uh, was supposed to be in Blackpool, taking an, a tour of England, and he mentioned to me that he will be there, and uh, I said, well, what's Blackpool? Where is that? What, what's, what's, what is there? He says to me, well, Blackpool, you know, it's a coastal town. It's kind of a mix between Las Vegas and Coney Island and Atlantic City, and, but also you, you have, you know, all this, like, nostalgic flair and fish and chips, so it's not really America, but it's kind of like America. Basically, it wasn't really a clear image. I didn't know what, what to, to, to expect there. He said, why don't you come along and, and see for yourself? And at the time, I actually wanted to uh, portray him. I wanted to photograph him in action as he photographs because I, I admire his work and I wanted to have some images of him. And something just told me, yeah, just go there and just see for yourself what, what uh, Blackpool's all about. But of course, I didn't plan a book, and I had absolutely no idea what I would find there, and the weather was supposed to be bad. So I figured, OK, I'll take pictures of the storm at sea. That's the worst thing that can happen. And I found myself in Blackpool pretty much for a weekend, uh, hence 48 hours Blackpool. Uh, well, I was there four days in total, incomplete four days, but um, I ended up shooting about eight hours every day, nonstop. And then I came up to 48 hours, and I thought, well, it is 48 hours Blackpool. And of course, it's also uh, representative of the fact that most people do come to Blackpool for a weekend. So the notion of being there 48 hours is, 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 is also um, an important detail in this project. And uh, as soon as I arrived in Blackpool, I immediately had the sense that there's something there for me to discover. There was a certain tension that I found in the air. There is a lot of... Um, a lot of contradiction between the sense of nostalgia, the historic um, sense of that particular town, and the contemporary trashy kind of uh, um, junk food, uh, Las Vegas flair, cheap parties, all night binge drinking. And at the same time, families with children who are dressed like dolls with lots of cute makeup and sparkles and bows in their hair and big skirts and they all walk around like fairy tale creatures and you just, this, this contrast is between these elements that don't seem to quite fit is what I felt uh, compelled to investigate for myself. So I just left the hotel with my camera 
um, and said, I'm just gonna walk along the promenade and just see what I find. And the promenade is really the main strip. It's like the Las Vegas strip of Blackpool where you have just herds of people a flow walking back and forth, back and forth, it's endless. And they're all uh, searching for um, fun, for food, for, um, they have gambling halls where you can play with one penny. So they have really entertainment for all levels and for all social classes. And these two young girls were standing at an intersection after a crazy night and crying and fighting and uh, I happened to have been crossing the street and I photographed them. Um, there are lots and lots of seagulls in Blackpool, of course, and this was actually taken on my very first day near a church uh, after I fed this particular seagull um, some of my tun tuna sandwich, and he was uh, happy and uh, took off. Um, you see a lot of children, you see a lot of, um, there's a great sense of desperation in Blackpool, which is something that I, did not look for and uh, also did not expect to find, but it was everywhere. I mean, you could really see how desperate people are there to, um, to find happiness in some form, at least over the weekend. You see children sitting on benches and, and looking unhappy, and, and uh, uh, you already notice how the, the hard lives that uh, their parents lead, how they impact their kids and uh, there's very little joy in the air. On one hand, you, s you, you realize that, that it's all about fun being there, but on the other hand, there is no fun. So it's like, no matter how much they look for it, they don't really find it. So it's again about, about this, this state, photographing this particular emotional state that people find themselves in, in these kinds of locations. And Elvis Presley is a, is a prominent figure there also. Uh, you see him everywhere. And, uh, they have all these beautiful rides that are very old and wooden in part. And everyone seems to some extent battered, battered by life, battered by the wind. The, the climate in Blackpool is very difficult. It's, it's, it's pretty cold and the sea is cold and uh, the wind is strong and you have incredible contrast there. So it's, it's not easy to photograph when it's very sunny. Uh, and uh, it just people are constantly in a state where they are fighting the elements or fighting each other <laughs> or uh, resisting life and, 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 and just trying to escape as much as possible. And at every opportunity they get. And uh, little children learning how to be violent <laughs> early on. <laughs> or not, maybe just playing, but still. Um, as I said, you can read an image in different ways. And it's hard to believe in some ways that this is England and modern England because in, in some parts or in most parts, if I'm perfectly honest, it almost feels like a third world country. Uh, and the poverty is really, um, yeah, it's visible everywhere. And it's, it's again, it's, it's very moving. But uh, when I was there during the summer for this particular, um, with this particular book, I mostly encountered tourists because that's what Blackpool is all about in the summer. It's about people visiting the town and uh, riding donkeys, which is a tradition there since uh, 50 years or longer. Um, this is the girl that was working on the beach and renting her donkeys for, for uh, rides. And then you have strange characters who are just standing and, and just uh, drawing circles in the sand and, and just uh, footprints and uh, high tide, low tide, it's, it's, it's a very interesting place because you get a sense in Blackpool as if there is no other place but Blackpool when you are there. It's as if all of life and, and the whole world and everything revolves around that pleasure strip, around the promenade, around the water. It's like the people there don't recognize even that there is a world outside of that particular location. They're completely absorbed in themselves and absorbed in their search for for pleasure. Yes, and here you also see a young lady chewing on her phone, I mean, uh, crying, and, and uh, you have to ask yourself, what, what do these people, like, what do they go through? What do they put themselves through, and for what, ultimately? And uh, you encounter that everywhere, at every corner. 
and it's it's never ending and then you see you know cute kids walking up and down and um there's, there's variety i mean in my work primarily as you can see i'm drawn to variety and i'm drawn to 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 movement and and uh, action and just uh It's hard to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Contrary to the other pictures, yes. in these pictures in Blackpool, yeah. you've got a, you've got a very wide sense of space. Yes. Uh, you have got the portraits, and but the space, the the, the, the town gets a very very big importance in your uh, way yes. of looking at things. Yes, that's true. Because here, uh, like I said, I found myself uh, probably for the first time shooting as intensely on the street. More, more intensely than ever. And it was very important to capture um, the, the environment because it's the, it was about the environment and what it does with the people and what the people do with it and this interaction between the person and the environment. And yesterday, and actually in the portfolio reviews, it was interesting that um, um, I, had, I had a gentleman showing me his work and he was telling me how he tries to capture landscapes and architecture but also the people in the image and I was telling him that it's it's very important how you go about it because photographing people and just photographing space are two very different things photographing a building is one thing and photographing a person <coughs> passing in front of the building you have a whole new image immediately and uh, humans are alive and they move mm -hmm. and uh, the wrong face expression in the image will change the whole image. And by wrong, I mean wrong for your purpose. Mm -hmm. Because you, you need to know what it is you're trying to show in a photograph. You're, you're, it's about showing what you see. And your vision has to be made clear, I think, to make the photo compelling to the viewer. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least it has to be clear to me <laughs> to start with. Yes, and we see people selling donuts, children working in donut. Um, it's a very old, very old from the 50s, I mean, uh, this, this donut shop. Yes, and this was actually, this is probably the only image in the entire series that is very, very compositionally balanced, mm -hmm. and it, is, it really stands out. And this was a photograph that I shot on my very first day when I went out with a 7200 <laughs> <laughs> lens, which I brought with me to Blackpool thinking, okay, I'm going to have all the best equipment and I'm going to really get some nice shots. Of course, I left this lens at the hotel room the same evening because I realized that it's, it's not what I need mm -hmm. because I wasn't going to take any more shots like that. But this is, for me, uh, an iconic image. And, and this is the Blackpool Tower, which is a replica of the Eiffel Turm, of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And it is the, the, fo the most important landmark in that town and uh, it's it came out very beautiful here you can't really see the details on the screen I mean on the pro uh, you know through the projector but you can actually see the little flag on top you can see the details the people the beautiful wind on this on this um, cloth the way it moves the the cone this is very very representative of the mm -hmm. positive feeling of Blackpool which is what I perceived only when I left my hotel. But as soon as I proceeded more down the promenade and I took the side streets, I realized that this ideal vision of Blackpool is really not all there is to that town. <laughs> it's just what Blackpool used to be or is supposed to be, but isn't any longer. And that is what I started investigating for myself. It reminds me of, you know, this uh, old pictures, old movies where uh, the movie starts and you've got yes this beautiful picture of the small town or small village yeah. from and then the camera zooms in and then we get to know into the houses the, the people and into and the, the yes. portraits and the little stories exactly yes and this is what what happened in me inside before i even i even um, started yeah as you can see an image like this it's again it's out of focus but it's really it's not the issue it's not it's not it doesn't bother me it's not really what it's about it's about this girl and about all, all her anticipation. And I was really fascinated by the fact of how you could really notice the different generations and how life, what the marks that life has left on these people. The younger the children, the more hopeful they are, the more fun they're able to have, 
the older they get, you notice how much stress they have. They almost feel, they, they, they force themselves to have a good time, but they don't really have it. And um, this contrast between the generations become very, very, becomes very obvious when you walk around in Blackpool and look at the people there. And uh, E.T., yes, this is just, uh, so it's really, it's a mix of, of um, environment and, and just atmosphere and mood. It's really a lot about mood in the pictures. Mood is very important to me. And this is, again, a, a show bar with Elvis and a young boy and, and just, you know, the way, how alert he seems, how disturbed, how distracted, how, how, how on edge in a way. Everyone there is on edge in Blackpool. And you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Why are they so much on edge? Why are they in a hurry? Why, wh what's going on in their minds? And of course, uh, they have the, the famous Blackpool Rock candy, which are like these giant candy sticks that are uh, traditional to Blackpool. And here I photographed a young girl and boy uh, eating these, <laughs> sucking on these Blackpool Rock candies. Um, I could mention that, of course, there's, there's in terms of, of um, health and, and Blackpool is really not on the, on the top uh, mm -hmm. of the list. You have a lot of um, obesity and, and a lot of young people in wheelchairs. And um, those, those are really the people who are not privileged. Those are the British who kind of get the short end of the stick. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is compelling to see how, how they try to, to, to forget their, their daily hardships and uh, come there and just uh, live life to the fullest. This is also a very classic um, street shot. But again, it's also, it's very clear what it is that I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in most of my images, it's pretty obvious what it is that I'm photographing. And it's usually a person who is at the center. Yes, and th this reminds me almost of a film still, the way this young boy exits this amusement uh, mm -hmm. arcade. There are lots of arcades. and So children gamble there from, from, from childhood on. I mean, people gamble from childhood on. And uh, you see that everywhere. And this is how they party at night. Uh, the girls there, they just, they, they know no limit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very cold there, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess the British are just, uh, they're very, they're not especially sensitive to the weather. Well, yes, this is the, this is the British flag and, and this is here. This is the first image here, but in this particular book, uh, this image is actually, oh, sorry. This image is actually towards the end. It's kind of a conclusion. Um, when I left Blackpool that summer, uh, I didn't even know what I photographed there and I had certainly not planned a book. I came home and I looked at the images for the first time and I realized that there's, uh, there's an incredible, well, very, very compelling body of work which I didn't even realize to have captured while there. And one thing led to another and a book came out of it. And I thought at that point that I was pretty much done with Blackpool because I thought I, I, I've captured all there is. I mean, what is there more to Blackpool than people running on the promenade and, and looking for a good time? and uh, the poverty and the, yeah. But it was all just a scratch on the surface, as it turned out, because um, after the book has been, after the work has been exhibited and um, got a lot of publicity, and I thought it was over, one day I received an email from a fan, from someone who's bought the book and, 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 and liked it, and uh, he thought that Blackpool is an interesting theme for me, and he sent me an old newspaper article about Blackpool um, behind the scenes, so to speak. Not about the tourists who come to Blackpool, but about the people who actually live there. And uh, I found, he thought it would be interesting for me to read. I found this gesture to be very compelling and um, I read the article and I immediately felt like uh, that's it, that I'm not finished with Blackpool, that there's, there, there's something there f yet for me to, to discover. And I decided to travel there again in the winter season, which means uh, is the, is the absolute opposite from, from what I'd seen before in the summer. And I did, I, I bought a plane ticket from one day to the next and uh, found myself in Blackpool in February. And in February, Blackpool is dead. 
there's nothing there. Shops are closed, nothing on the promenade, stormy sea, cold, seagulls all over the place looking for food that they can't find. Lots and lots and lots of um, poor people and um, drug addicts and uh, really the behind the scenes uh, um, of the promenade. And um, I devoted myself in that week to getting to know these people a bit better and, and, and approach them closer and came up with the book uh, titled Of Lions and Lambs. And um, yes, and there's a reason for the title. And uh, this reason you will find out, I guess, best when you open the book and flip to the end, through the pages, turn the pages and come to the end. Uh, because again, it's also about contrasts and it's about uh, the things that we don't see on the surface that we discover later on. And uh, with Lions of Lambs, I came a lot closer to get to know the people I, I, I worked with. There's still plenty of images in the book of, of street photography, but there are also some images taken in interiors. I visited soup kitchens and, um, and different uh, hotels where uh, you, know, you saw very, very old people, very desperate people. Um, I went to uh, night shelters and spoke to young people and, and they told me their life stories. Um, and I, I documented all that in the book. And there was also, of course, there unexpectedly enough in a place like Blackpool, uh, a gay scene. And this was um, taken on stage during a performance at a very famous funny girls cabaret type of um, hall. And in this book, there's another element that you don't see in the first book, and that is animals. And uh, usually animals in cages and some out on the street. Because for me, um, I, I, as I discovered for myself, is that uh, the people in Blackpool and the animals, they're all behind bars, um, literally and figuratively speaking. They're all prisoners uh, to some extent. The animals are prisoners in the zoo or wherever they are, and the people are prisoners uh, of the system and prisoners of their misery. And uh, something that is very compelling that I discovered in my uh, second project was the fact, after speaking to people, that many of the people who live in Blackpool actually um, had wonderful memories of their childhood spent in Blackpool with their parents and their grandparents. And uh, once their lives didn't work out in other towns, they decided to come to Blackpool to make a fresh start and sort of turn the page and somehow believing that the, the, the memories and the positive associations that they have will help them get a new start. But actually, uh, this is not what they find because Blackpool has a very high un unemployment rate, people don't have any opportunities really, and they find themselves sinking even lower than, than where they were when they arrived. And uh, they fall into, into drugs and poverty, and, uh, and they still hold on to these positive memories, because as soon as you ask them, they immediately tell you all about them. And that's something that I thought was um, very moving. This is a girl that I met, a young woman is completely uh, heavily addicted to drugs and she was so happy that I, I wanted to spend some time with her and ask her questions that she even stopped consuming for a few days. She, and she announced that to me so proud that she hasn't taken anything because she wanted to really pay attention to me and take me to the different soup kitchens and tell me all the stories. But of course that didn't last long and I saw her again another day and she was back to where she was before I arrived. So um, they don't get all that much help there. And the truth is that even those who get help, they don't always um, accept it. They don't always take this help. Because once you fall so low, it's really not very easy to, to stand back up. This is the, the gentleman who was the first um, to have greeted me in Blackpool <laughs> because when I arrived there in the, in the winter, I mean in February, I really had no idea what to do. There were no people on the street. There was nothing. And I thought to myself, why did I even come here? How crazy is that? What am I going to photograph? And uh, then I met him, and uh, his name was Alan, and he's, uh, everyone calls him the Birdman because he travels into Blackpool from a neighboring small uh, town, 
with a little broken trolley with bird food and he feeds the pigeons and he pays fines because uh, you're not allowed to feed, pige feed, feed pigeons in Blackpool, which he does anyway, because the pi pigeons apparently are uh, neglected. And uh, yeah, and so I took a portrait of him here. And um, this was during a visit to a, to a family in Blackpool. As you can see, this child is also not in the best, uh, not in the best state. Very warm-hearted, wonderful people. And this is something that neither you nor I expect to find in Blackpool. And this is a, a masquerade party at, a, at an uh, old hotel. And this is the, so to speak, the, the, the upper class that uh, I happen to have <coughs> come upon uh, on my last night in Blackpool. I was leaving pretty much the next day. And as I was uh, about to leave the hotel where I was staying, suddenly they all walk in. This masquerade party with these Saint Laurent uh, bags and champagne. And my head, my mind was, was saturated with poverty and homelessness. And I could not believe that Blackpool has this kind of, uh, of a social layer, this kind of people. And I realized that those are the lions those are the lions that uh, stand in opposition to the lambs that sort of get slaughtered by the system. And I stayed there and I, and I photographed um, this party. And what, what struck me the most is, is how the people, how they didn't seem happy either. And they didn't seem to have any particular appreciation for uh, everything they have and the privileges they have. They seemed spoiled and they seemed uh, they just, they didn't move me nearly as, as much as uh, everyone else I met to this point, to that point. Yes, yeah, so this was also, this is again um, a prostitute that I photographed in Blackpool. I knew that I have to uh, photograph a prostitute there because I knew they're there, but I didn't know where to find them. And I, I wanted to, to um, investigate that part of the town because I heard about it. And uh, there was a kind of a massage parlor sign and I went and I knocked on the door and she opened the door and I knew that she was the one. And she was very kind and very open and uh, we, we, we had a whole photo session together and uh, I actually paid her for her time because she had some clients coming in but I was there so she sent them away and, and I said to her that, you know, I would pay her whatever she would like for the time that she, she spent with me. And um, she agreed, and we had a wonderful um, session together. Yes. And here we see again this, this greed and, and this, this, this intensity reflected um, in the pigeons and how they, they eat their grain and seeds that are thrown to them. Yes, people you see on the street again in Blackpool. She's a model, and she came to Blackpool uh, looking for luck. I can't imagine that she found it, but um, yes, it's a lady. Her name is Barbara. I actually photographed her home as well. She's a, what we call in Germany a messy. She's a hoarder. So I have images in the book of her home, and you can see the extent to which she hoards everything. Um, and she can't let go of anything. You could see that in all the little items and, and, and mess in her home. This is an elephant at a zoo. It doesn't look very happy either. A view of the sea. The sea is, is, is uh, very dominant there. Interestingly enough, in my first project, I, I barely photographed the sea. I don't even think I have any images of the sea. But in my second project, where the streets were so empty, I could finally see it. I could finally see the water and, 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 and get a, a more, more sense of the, of the atmosphere and less of the, of the people. This is again Nicole, this prostitute in her home. You can see the, the environment she lives in and works in. Yes, this I shot um, in my hotel room outside my window. 
I actually had the crazy idea of putting a tuna sandwich on my windowsill overnight because there was no place to eat that evening. <laughs> and I had the tuna sandwich from the airport and I packed it in a, in a nice tight plastic bag and tied it on, uh, on, the, on the window and, and was sure that it would be held and the wind won't blow it away. And the next morning I hear just endless and I look outside the window and these seagulls just punctured the bag and pulled my sandwich out. And then they were fighting over the food and I photographed them in the, in, in, in the moment of, 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 of fighting for that particular toonfish. Oops, sorry, where did I go? Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, this is, a, this is a homeless young man and also uh, photographed on the street. They're very young, they don't look young uh, because life uh, has left its mark on them. This you must have seen on the, on the <laughs> photography festival page, the dog. The dogs are not very friendly in Blackpool. They're usually uh, a Kampf, uh, uh, what do you call them? Dogs that are, mm. yeah, yeah. I can't think of the term. Right now. Yes, yeah, so this is again a young woman at a at a soup kitchen in the back room where they do their laundry. A little lamp awaiting its uh, destiny. A little boy as well. Yes, and you, you have to ask yourself, what, it, what will it be? Um, <coughs> yes, uh, a trans uh, a drag queen also. I met her out on the street on a rainy night, and she was just very excited to be photographed, and I took some pictures of her. Yes, this is a, a man who came to get a, a new tattoo, and this is the back room of that tattoo parlor. So. You can imagine uh, the kind of conditions you get tattooed under uh, over there. And I just, I just love the way he laughs and, and the fact that he's toothless, of course, adds charm to the whole <laughs> image. But uh, other than that, he's pretty healthy and strong and happy. So, I mean, yeah, so this is a homeless woman on the street that just got a bunch of cigarettes um, from a passerby on her book. You could see them. Um, this was actually, this image was actually shot right before the masquerade images, so it was still so fresh in my mind when I saw the masquerade ball. Yes, this is a pierced painting. It's a Michelangelo on a wooden board with piercings um, everywhere. Can't quite see them here, but you see it in the original well enough. And uh, yes, this is a moment of a, uh, yeah, a beggar getting some coins, and you can see in her eyes this, this, this surprise that she even gets anything. This is again a soup kitchen under the bridge near the water. Yes, this is again a, a drag queen performer, also staring into space, staring into nowhere, really. You see that a lot in Blackpool. One of the visitors to a, to a karaoke bar. You can see how close I come to the people in this shot. And this is uh, taking in Jerusalem. I was there for a while and I took some photographs in uh, Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. And this is also very classic um, street photography, what you see here. This is a woman selling uh, dried figs next to the Orthodox Church that is considered to be the birthplace of the Virgin Mary. And I was passing by and I saw how she was reaching the figs to one of the women exiting the church and I just caught this moment. I thought she had so much, um, so much, uh, such an honorable face and so much, so much uh, dignity. And I wanted to capture her face. This was very important to me. And that dried hand and the dried figs as well. Those are little religious boys in, um, in a religious neighborhood, orthodox neighborhood in Tel Aviv. I thought they had very beautiful, fascinating 
faces, their eyes, and they looked at me with such fascination and curiosity because they're not used to being photographed at all. You're actually not even supposed to walk around with a camera in that area, and especially if you're a woman and you're wearing pants. That's <laughs> I immediately noticed that um, that wasn't a good idea to come there wearing jeans, but uh, somehow it was all right. I managed to take some shots, and nobody <laughs> threw stones at me. Um, this is a church, the Orthodox Church. I love how her kerchief and, and then the figures in the background harmonize. Girls, also in the Orthodox neighborhood. A dog with uh, his back legs, crippled dog, pretty much, with a makeshift uh, uh, wheels to help him move around. <coughs> yes, and this is a, a woman, drunk, uh, addicted. I actually followed her on the street until I got this shot. She was talking to herself the whole time, and it was waving her arms and talking to herself, and it was very difficult to actually get a good, good shot of her. So and she was speaking Russian, interestingly enough. So I imagine she's one of those immigrants who moved to Israel who didn't have much luck in, uh, in uh, finding uh, what they were looking for. And uh, she ended up on the street in this condition, and I followed her around until we came to, to, to Jaffa, and that's where I finally just found the best angle to, to photograph her making this gesture. One of the severe faces you see of the Arabs in Jerusalem. And yes, nurses. I mean, this is in the Muslim quarter. So you see everything there. You see the, the Muslims and Christians and Jews, and it's all mixed, and, and the languages are mixed, and the people are mixed, and everyone's there for, for, its, own, for, for its own purpose. Everyone's looking for something in old Jerusalem. This as well, and the situation is very tense there. There's a lot of security, a lot of military, so uh, the streets are very narrow, so it's very, really not easy to photograph there. And I do work with a very large camera. I guess I, I, I may have or may have not mentioned it. I don't work with a small one, so my camera is, is, is very visible. So people see that I have it in my hand. Um, but it's also heavy to, to carry around and, and shoot, especially if you shoot from the hip, it all goes on your wrist. So if the environment is not especially uh, comfortable, then of course the tension rises and it's um, not so easy to get the best shots. You have to really, you know, try harder. This is at the Western Wall. And again, this is, uh, I thought that moment is the gaze in his eyes, the way he looks, and all these white, white cloths everywhere. This is very documentary, I would say. It's, it's kind of kind of journalism. Little boy in a market. A young soldier at the entrance or exit and entrance to the Muslim quarter, an Israeli soldier. This is in Beersheba in the Negev. This is uh, at the market. An Arab woman who noticed that I w was taking a picture and her eyes widened at that site, and a little boy in the market in Jerusalem, again, standing and, and thinking about life or <laughs> about when his father is finally, finally going to come and fetch him. Uh, but again, you can see some images are very dynamic, other images are calm. So it really depends on what comes um, towards me, and uh, that's what I photograph. And if it can be a cat, or it can be a fake dog, or um, I follow my, my intuition very much on the street, and I rely on my intuition, and uh, that's my guide. So this is in the church again. I thought it was lovely how the light was entering and her face expression, and she sits all small behind the counter. This is at a nightclub in Israel, also very odd kind of um, ambiance. And this is, uh, yeah, under the bridge, also in Israel.
Yes, I think this was the last image in this particular sequence. I have absolutely no idea how we are with time. <laughs> so it's so easy to lose track of it. It's almost like when you work on the street, you also don't have any sense of time <laughs> until the sun sets, and then you know that, OK, you've. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, where? Yes. Well, a few words of conclusion, and then we start with the questions. Or, yes, or sure. Or up to me for the conclusion. <laughs> no, I, I find your pictures, I don't know if it's because probably I know you are Russian, so I, I permanently think of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and this expressionist scenes in this literature. I, I, I recognize all these in your pictures, this That's feeling for the extremist uh, extremism. Uh, the, the emotions, the, the warmth, uh, you know, I, it's like reading in Russian books, so I don't know if it's connected, but that's it is connected. something that's I, I saw in your pictures. That's and also I know. thought very much about, I don't know, one of picture made me think about Tom Waits, mm. you know, Tom yes. Waits and his, his scenery, his imagery and his music, and uh, maybe some of you know the, the album, um, Sword fish trombone, something like that, or is a song in the neighborhood. So I don't know. Your pictures are totally inside this universe, this poetical universe, very dramatic, but at the same time never making fun of people. So uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. The, the name I was looking for before it's Martin Pa, of course. Uh, Martin so Pa. So you're yes. not Martin Pa. I am not uh, and Martin. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no. <laughs> because really, I, I appreciate the, the the way you look at things. So. Uh, mm. Maybe, well, I talk too much, so mm -hmm. I want to give you the opportunity to ask some questions to Benita. <laughs> so please, Ar Arlindo. Okay, is there a microphone? That was a very good comment regarding the Russian literature, because actually at the, at the interview for the Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg Award, I mentioned that I have, I have a bit of a tendency towards uh, quote unquote sentimentality, but not sentimentality in terms of something very saccharine and sweet, but in terms of, of, of appreciating memory and appreciating emotion. Also, yeah. And uh, I th this is something that I feel attracted to, and I guess that I'm happy if, if it comes through in the images. That's oh yes, for sure. If, if you saw it, then that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. That means I, I, I've accomplished whatever it is I was after on some unconscious level at least. Ah. <laughs> yes. Congratulations and thank you for this moment. And okay. two, just uh, two small questions. First one, do, have you ever received a no when you're photographing <laughs> in this process? And the second one, how do you deal with the taking a photo and then uh, the consent to publish it? How, because you see a lot of children on, on your photos and mm -hmm. I don't know, they consent to photograph, I think so, we don't have a problem, maybe we don't have a problem and photograph them or with their parents, I don't know. But then when you publish, how, how do we deal with that? Because some, when we approach in the streets, we yeah. can take a photo, but then yeah. can we publish it? Okay, so well, thank you. Yeah, if I'm, that, that was the second question. Yeah, what was yeah. the first one again? The first one is, have you ever received the So it's connected. The, the two. Well, to answer both questions, well, to answer the second question first, <laughs> I just take my chances, pretty much. I mean, uh, if I start thinking about, oh, should I take the picture? Should I not take the picture? Uh, what will be, what are the consequences? Then I might as well not take the picture. I might as well just take my camera, pack it away, and go home and just do something else. <laughs> because uh, it's either you photograph life the way it unfolds out there, and you, you devote yourself entirely to it, and you clear your mind, and you just go for the shot, or you begin thinking about all the risks you're taking and, and what will happen if, and then you're done. You might as well just stop there. Um, when it comes to getting a no, um, explicitly, I mean, in Blackpool especially, I didn't get any no's. In Blackpool, interestingly enough, people um, simply ignored me. They were so busy with themselves that they really didn't care who I am, why I'm there, uh, if I'm photographing them or not. They just didn't see me. It's almost like I was invisible. And I was the only photograph photographer there. I mean, I didn't see anyone. Nobody comes to Blackpool to take pictures. <laughs> it's not the kind of place you go to, to, to do anything, really, except what, you know, 
what these people do. So I didn't receive any explicit no's. I do, uh, when I work on the street or anywhere, I have to be very sensitive to my environment. I have to be sensitive to the energy of the people, to how they react to my presence, if they react, if I sense that someone senses me and does not want to be photographed, I will not do it because I'm not looking for trouble and I'm not looking to make anyone feel uncomfortable, especially if I come so close with my camera. Um, and of course, if someone said no, then that's out of the question, uh, but yes. And when it comes to publishing, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of gray area. I mean, it's hard to say. I just do it. And I hope that those who see it will understand and appreciate and not necessarily uh, perceive this uh, with any kind of negativity. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's our fate as, as, as street photographers. We can't escape it, so we just have to take it and whatever it brings with it and deal with it. And uh, yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Never forget the artistic uh, the freedom of expression artistic freedom of expression absolutely. that's that's yes. something that you you can yes. always uh, refer to absolutely yes another question someone no photo would be taken if if we would restrict ourselves that way we cannot document life if we restrict ourselves children, with children yes well i most of the children are close to their parents and and i don't think i have any children depicted in any way that compromises them so and, and usually there are more people on the street, so it's, I think those are pretty safe images. I don't think there's anything very controversial in there. Or you can look for yourself later and decide for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Another question? If there, is, if there is no question, it's just a comment. I will give you a complimentary feedback from Paolo's feedback. I didn't think of the uh, Russian literature, I thought of Connecticut because you mentioned it. <laughs> so I thought, next time I'm, I am in Connecticut and I see that those places where the house must be white and the barn must be red with and a clean street and some no pigeon and no trash, I will have a big smile thinking back of you and your oh. joyful presentation of about escaping those things. <laughs> That's very funny. That's very kind. Thank you. And remember, it's southern Connecticut. It's very different from northern <laughs> Connecticut. <laughs> so once you're there, just make sure you see the difference. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Another question, maybe uh, a comment on your black and white. I, I, you have got a very high contrast mm. in the pictures. It's mm. Of course, it's the way you want it. So it's always the way you look at things, uh, or it depends on the places. For Blackpool, for uh, this whole series, it's always this, this coherence, uh, this coherent black and white. So, yeah. yes, I, I think that I, I've also asked myself this question. I think that uh, I, I do enjoy uh, strong contrast. I think it also um, reflects and complements thematically what's depicted in the image. I like these hard edges. Mm -hmm. I like this, uh, this, this white and black coming together mm -hmm. and fighting each other for dominance, and that happens when you have high contrast, and okay. I find that exciting. Of course, you have to be careful with that. Uh, it can be too much, um, but I enjoy that. Okay. I, like, I like when things are dramatic, like you said, and, and strong and, and mm -hmm. expressive. Everything that is soft and neutral, it just it bores me, and I'm not really attracted to it. So okay. I follow that aesthet this line aesthetically and thematically as well. Mm. Yeah, it goes well together to your yeah. reflection on the dual society, yeah, the poor and the rich. And the Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And, and happiness and misery and, and all these contrasts and yes, contradictions yeah. all because we are full of contradictions also inside yeah, of us yeah. and full of contrasts and what pulls us in one direction and the other direction. And this constant um, sort of whatever is yeah. happening inside of us, I like when I can see that happening on the outside and mm. then capture it. Yeah, yeah. The crying and, and the laughing at the same time. So yes. the extreme yes. sensations. Yes, in this our extreme is, is very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yes, true. Um, I, I appreciate it also, uh, I hope you, you also did the, the whole series about the Berlin lives. So because the energy was so much strong, 
but and the people so much you know yeah. happy in a strange way in a like strange in a vanity way. fair you know yes like a circus around but yeah. you captured this energy so intensely so that was strong that good i'm yeah. glad i'm glad <laughs> to hear that because uh, like i said these images uh, were taken when i wasn't even sure what i was doing yet <laughs> so i guess uh, this this intuitive pool uh, was what was my guide from the very start mm -hmm. this intensity and i'm glad that it comes through it's important oh, yes for sure a last question, and then, and then it's time to make a, sp uh, a pause. Yes. Yeah. Th thank you so much, Benita. Um, I, I have a question relating to your gear, which you uh, mentioned that you you don't use a small camera. Is it something you do on purpose um, in order just to engage um, the look at the eyes of your subject, mm -hmm. or is it something that it's, it's just random? that you don't want to use a small camera? I think it's more, it's, it's just more of a, the answer is much more simple than any of these options that you can. <laughs> I actually just enjoy the feeling of a big camera in my hand. I love the weight, I love the sound, I love that click, <laughs> I want to hear it. It's like hearing the engine roar when you drive. You just want to <laughs> hear the engine. You want to give gas and you want to feel the weight of the car, yeah? This is how I, I feel my camera. My, ca my camera is my tool. It's my extension, and I need to feel its substance in my hand. And even if it hurts my wrist at the end of the day, I, I can't shoot with a small camera. <laughs> it just doesn't work for me. I don't feel it. It's like air. <laughs> and the big one, it says I'm here. Use me. <laughs> and I use it <laughs> to the fullest. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. But um, I'm glad you didn't ask me any technical questions because I really... That's really not my thing. <laughs> I'm still analog in my head. I don't even know what my, the manual of my camera looks like. I don't even know what it says. And frankly, I don't even care. As long as I get my picture, then that's Benita, all I'm Benita, happy about. Venita, incredible. You, you do incredible technical <laughs> things there. I, I was like wondering what? all the time, how does she do that? Like what? I don't know. Each picture is, 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 is wonderfully on the technical side so really wow no no do continue like that ignoring the technique really? and doing wonderful things i am ignoring <laughs> i don't like the ticket that te anything technical well, is, is a problem i like to hear that <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay so now Great. it's the moment to uh, stop a little bit thank you very much thank you. benita thank uh, you <laughs> Don't forget, now it's a little moment for if you wish to have the book signed uh, at, in, uh, the, uh, at the entrance, at the Librerie Ernst stand with mm -hmm. Benita. And in 20 minutes, more or less, no, maybe more, <laughs> I would say in half an hour, to leave you a little bit time to relax, we have the panel discussion. Oh.